Uh, hi, everyone. It is time for another chapter of The Blue Castle. Um, I'm sorry I took a little bit of time away. I like, sort of a flare-up of scleroderm, and I was not feeling very well at all. I did get somebody asked me why my voice sounds a little off. Uh, that, again, is the scleroderma. One of the things that it did, along with Sjogren's syndrome, which I also have, is it really hit my teeth hard, and I had to have them all extracted because they were falling out anyway. They were really, really, it hurt a lot, and it's not uncommon with scleroderma for that to happen. And I had dentures made, but I got sores in my mouth on the scleroderma, so I can't wear my dentures most of the time. So I go around looking like an apple doll, I guess, but hey, that's life. At least I'm still able to do most of the things I want to do, and if all the worst of it is is I lost my teeth, well, perfect. Could be so much worse. Anyway, here is the next chapter of the story, and Valancey, if you remember, is considering whether or not to go to the library and to visit the doctor about her heart. So we'll see where she and her mother and her cousin Stickles are getting along. Now, this is chapter four. Got your rubbers on? Called Cousin Stickles as Valancey left the house. Christine Stickles had never once forgotten to ask that question, and Valancey went out on a damp day. Yes, I have them. Have you got your flannel petticoat on? asked Miss Frederick. No. Doss, I really do not understand you. Do you want to catch your death of cold again? Her voice implied that Valancey had died of a cold several times already. Go upstairs this minute and put it on. Mother, I don't need a flannel petticoat. My sateen one is warm enough. Das, remember you had bronchitis two years ago. Go and do as you're told. And this is a 29-year-old woman. Valancey went, though nobody will ever know, just how near she came to hurtling the hated rubber plant into the street before she went. She hated that gray flannel petticoat more than any other garment she owned. All have never had to wear flannel petticoats. All of wore ruffled silk and sheer lawn and flimsy laced flounces. But all his father had married money, and Olive had never had bronchitis, so there you were. Are you sure you didn't leave the soap in the water? demanded Mrs. Frederick. But the Lancy was gone. She turned the corner and looked back down the ugly, prim, respectable street where she lived. The Sterling house was the ugliest on it, more like a red brick box than anything else. Too high for its breadth, and made still higher by a bulbous glass couple on top. About it was the desolate, barren piece of an old house whose life has lived. It was a very pretty house of leaded casement windows and dub gables just around the corner. A new house, one of those houses you would love the minute you see them. Clayton Markley had built it for his bride. He was to be married to Jenny Lloyd in June. The little house, it was said, was furnished from attic to cellar in complete readiness for its mistress. I don't envy Jenny the man, thought the Lancy. Sincerely, Clayton Markley was not one of her many ideals, but I do envy her that house. Such a nice young house. Oh, if I could only have a little house of my own, even so poor and tiny, but my own. But then, she added bitterly, there's no use in yowling for the moon when you can't even get a tallow candle. In dreamland, nothing would do for Valancey but a castle of pale sapphire. In real life, she would have been fully satisfied with a little house of her own. She envied Jelly Lloyd more fiercely than ever today. Jenny was not so much better looking than she was, and not so very much younger. Yet she was to have this delightful house, and the nicest little wedge with teacups. Valancey had seen them, an open fireplace, and a monogrammed linen hemstitched tablecloths, and china closets. Why did everything come to some girls and nothing to others? It wasn't fair. Valancey was once more seething with rebellion, as she walked along the prim, dowdy little figure in her shabby raincoat and three-year-old hat, splashed occasionally by the mud of a passing motor with its insulting shrieks. Motors, I'm guessing they mean car, were still rather a novelty in Deerwood, though they were common in Port Lawrence, and most of the summer residents up at Muskoka had them. In Deerwood, only some of the smart set had them, for even Deerwood was divided into two sets. There was a smart set, the intellectual set, the old family set, of which the Sterlings were members, the, co the common run, and a few pariahs. 
Not one of the Sterling clan has yet condescended to a motor, though Olive was teasing her father to have one. Valencia had never even been in a motor car, but she did not hanker after this. In truth, she felt rather afraid of motor cars, especially at night. They seemed to be too much like big purring beasts that might turn and crush you, or make some terrible savage leap somewhere. On the steep mountain trails around her blue castle, only gaily caprizen steeds might proudly pace, and in real life, Delancey would have been quite content to drive in a buggy behind a nice horse. She got a buggy drive only when some uncle or cousin remembered to fling her a chance like a bone to a dog. Okay, chapter five. Of course she must buy the tea at Uncle Benjamin's grocery store. To buy it anywhere else was unthinkable. Yet Delancey hated to go into Uncle Benjamin's store on her 29th birthday. There was no hope that he would not remember it. Why, demanded Uncle Benjamin leeringly as he tied up her tea. A young lady's like bad grammarians. Delancey, with Uncle Benjamin's will in the background of her mind, said meekly, I don't know why. Because, chuckled Uncle Benjamin, it can't decline matrimony. The two clerks, Joe Hammond and Cl Claude Bertram, chuckled also, and Delancey disliked them a little more than ever. On the first day Claude Burton had seen her in the store, she had heard him whisper to Joe, Who is that? And Joe had said, Delancey Sterling, one of the Deerwood old maids. Curable or incurable? Claude had asked with a snicker, evidently thinking the question was very clever. Delancey smarted anew with the sting of that old recollection. Twenty-nine, Uncle Benjamin was saying, Dear me, Doss, you're dangerously near the second corner and not even thinking about getting married yet. Twenty-nine, that seems impossible. Now, Uncle Benjamin said an original thing. Uncle Benjamin said, How time does fly. <laughs> How creative, huh? I think it crawls, said the Lancey passionately. Passion was so alien to Uncle Benjamin's conception of the Lancey that he didn't know what to make of her. To cover his confusion, he asked another conundrum as he tied up her beans. Cousin Stickles had remembered at the last moment they must have beans. Beans are cheap in filling. What two ages are apt to prove illusory, asked Uncle Benjamin. And, not waiting for Valancey to give up, he added, a mirage, a mi and mirage. I'm guessing he means a mirage and marriage. Mirage is pronounced miraz, said Valancey shortly, picking up her tea and her beans. For the moment, she did not care whether Uncle Benjamin cut her out of his will or not. She walked out of the store while Uncle Benjamin stared after her, with his mouth open. Then he shook his head. Poor Doss is taking it hard, he said. Valancey was sorry by the time she reached the next crossing. Why had she lost her patience like that? Uncle Benjamin would be annoyed and would likely tell her mother that Doss had been impertinent to me, and her mother would lecture her for a week. I've held my tongue for twenty-nine years, thought Valancey. Why couldn't I have held it once now? Yes, it was just twenty. Vala okay, so twenty years, not twenty-nine years. Yes, it was just twenty, Valancey reflected. She and she had first been twitted with her about her loveless condition. She remembered the bitter moment perfectly. She's just nine years old. She's standing alone in the school playground. The other little girls of her class were playing a game in which you must be chosen by a boy as his partner before you could play. Nobody had chosen Delancey, little pale black-haired Delancey, with her prim long sleeve apron and odd slanted eyes. Oh, said a pretty little girl to her, I'm sorry for you. You haven't got a bow. Delancey had said defiantly, as she continued to say for twenty years, I don't want a bow. But this afternoon, the Lancey, once and for all, stopped saying that. I'm going to be honest with myself anyhow, she thought savagely. Uncle Benjamin's riddles hurt me because they're true. I do want to be married. I want a house of my own. I want a husband of my own. I want sweet little fat babies of my own. The Lancey stopped suddenly aghast at her own recklessness. She felt sure that Reverend Dr. Stalling, who passed her at this moment, read her thoughts and disproved of them thoroughly. Valancey was afraid of Dr. Stalling, had been afraid of him ever since the Sunday, twenty-three years before. He had first come to St. Albans. Valancey had been too late for Sunday school that day, and she had gone into the church timidly and sat in their pew. No one else was in the church, nobody except for the new rector, Dr. Stalling. 
Dr. Stalling stood up at the front of the school, the choir door, beckoned to her and said sternly, little boy, come up here. Valancy had stared around her. There was no little boy. There was no one at all in the huge church but herself. The strange man with the blue glasses couldn't mean her. She was not a boy. Little boy, repeated Dr. Stalling, more sternly, more sternly still, sternly still, shaking his forefinger fiercely at her. Come up here at once. Delancey arose as if hypnotized and walked up that aisle. She was too terrified to do anything else. What dreadful thing was going to happen to her? What had happened to her? Had she actually turned into a boy? She came to a stop in front of Dr. Stalling. Dr. Stalling shook his forefinger, such a long knuckly forefinger, at her and said, Little boy, take off your hat. Valancey took off her hat. She had a scrawny little pigtail hanging down her back, but Dr. Stalling was not was short-sighted, and he did not perceive it. Little boy, go back to your seat and always take your hat off in church. Remember that. Valancey went back to her seat, carrying her hat like an automaton. Presently, her mother came in. Da, said Miss Sterling, what do you mean by making taking off your hat? Put it on instantly. Valancey put it on instantly. She was cold with fear lest Dr. Stalling should immediately summon her up front again. She would have to go, of course. It never occurred to her that one could disobey the rector. And the church is full of people now. Oh, what would she do if that horrible stabbing forefinger were shaken at her again before all those people? Valancey sat through the whole service in an agony of dread and was sick for a week afterwards. Nobody knew why. Frederick, Mrs. Frederick again bemoaned herself and her delicate child. Dr. Stalling found out his mistake and laughed over it to Valancey, who did not laugh. She never got over her dread of Dr. Stalling, and now to be caught by him on the street corner thinking such things. Poor Dr. Stalling would probably have a fit if he were alive today. He'd probably be like passed out on the sidewalk, seeing what some people talk about now. Valancey got her John Foster book at the library. Magic of Wings. It's latest. It's all about birds, said Miss Clarkson. She'd almost decided that she would go home instead of going to see Dr. Trent. Her courage had failed her. She was afraid of offending Dr. No, she was afraid of offending Uncle James, afraid of angering her mother, afraid of facing gruff, shaggy bowed Dr. Trent, who would probably tell her, as he told Cousin Gladys, that her trouble was entirely imaginary and she'd only had it because she liked to have it. No, she would not go. She would get a bottle of Redfern's Purple Pills instead. Redfern's Purple Pills were the standard medicine in the Sterling clan. I guess it was a type of patent medicine, I'm guessing. Had they not cured, had they not cured second cousin Geraldine when five doctors had given her up? Delancey always felt very skeptical concerning the virtues of the Purple Pills, but there might be something in them, and it's easier to take them than to face Dr. Trent alone. She would glance she would glance over at the magazines in the reading room for a few minutes and then go home. Valancey tried to read a story, but it made her furious that every page was a picture of the heroine surrounded by adoring men. And here was she, Valancey Sterling, who could not get a solitary bow of her, of her own. Valancey slammed the magazine shut, and instead she opened Magic of Wings. Her eyes fell on the paragraph that changed her life. I always actually liked this saying. Fear is the original sin, wrote John Foster. Almost all of the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. I think that's very true. It is a cold, slimy serpent coiling around you. It is horrible to live with fear, and it is, of all things, degrading. Valancey shut magic wings and stood up. She would go and see Dr. Trent. So let's see how long the next chapter is. Oh, dear. Well, how about we head on to the next chapter? and then we'll call it a day. The ordeal was not so dreadful after all. Dr. Trent was as gruff and abrupt as usual, but he did not tell her her ailment was imaginary. After he had listened to her symptoms and asked a few questions and made a quick examination, he sat for a moment looking at her quite intently. Valancey thought he looked as if he were sorry for her. She caught her breath for a moment. Was the trouble serious? Oh, it couldn't be, surely. It really hadn't bothered her that much. Only lately it had gotten a little worse. Dr. Trent opened his mouth, but before he could speak, the telephone at his elbow rang sharply. He picked up the receiver. 
Delancey, watching him, saw his face change suddenly as he listened. Though, yes, yes, what? Yes, yes, and then after a brief interval, my God. Dr. Trent dropped the receiver, dashed out the room, and upstairs without even a glance at Delancey. She heard him rushing madly about overhead, barking out a few remarks to somebody, presumably his housekeeper. Then he came tearing downstairs with a club bag in his hand, snatched his hat and coat from the rack, jerked open the street door, and rushed down the street in the direction of the train station. Delancey sat alone in the little office, feeling more absolutely foolish than he, she had ever felt before in her life. Foolish and humiliated. So this was all that had come of her heroic determination to live up to John Foster and cast fear aside. Not only was she a failure as a relative and non-existent as a sweetheart or friend, but she was not as even of any importance as a patient. Dr. Trent had forgotten her very presence in his excitement over whatever the message had come through by telephone. She gained nothing by ignoring Uncle James and flying in the face of family tradition. For a moment she was afraid she was going to cry. It was all so ridiculous. Then she heard Dr. Trent's housekeeper coming down the stairs. Valancey rose and went to the office door. The doctor forgot all about me, she said with a twisted smile. Oh, well, that's too bad, said Miss Patterson sympathetically. But it wasn't much wonder, poor man. That was a telegram. They phoned over from the port. His son has been terribly injured in an auto accident in Montreal. The doctor has just ten minutes to catch the train. I don't know what he'll do if anything happens to Ned. He's just bound up in that boy. You'll have to go come again, Miss Sterling. I hope it's nothing serious. Oh, no, nothing serious, agreed Lancy. She felt a little less humiliated. It was no wonder poor Dr. Prent had forgotten her at such a moment. Nevertheless, she felt very flat and discouraged as she went down the street. The Lancy went home by the shortcut of Lover's Lane. She did not often go through Lover's Lane, but it was getting near supper time. It would never do to be late. Lover's Lane wound back up the village, under great elms and maples, and deserved its name. It was hard to go there at any time and not find some canoodling couple or young girls in pairs, arms intertwined, earnestly talking over their secrets. The Lancy didn't know, which made her feel more self-conscious and uncomfortable. This evening she encountered both. She met Connie Hale and Kate Bailey in new pink organdy dresses with flounces, flowers stuck coquettishly in their glossy bare hair. The Lancy had never had a pink dress or worn flowers in her hair. Then she passed a young couple she didn't know, dandering along, oblivious to everything but themselves. The young man's arms were around the girl's waist quite shamelessly. Oh dear, sorry about that. That was the phone. At any rate. Okay, we are back to the young man's arms was the young man's arm was around the girl's waist quite shamelessly. Valancey had never walked with a man's arm around her. She thought that she ought to be shocked. They might leave some they might leave that sort of thing for the screening twilight at least. But she wasn't shocked. In another flash of desperate stark honesty, she owed to herself that she was merely envious. When she passed them, she felt quite sure they were laughing at her, pitying her, and there's that queer little old maid, the Lancy Sterling again. And I say she never had a bow in her whole life. The Lancy fairly ran to get out of Lover's Lane. Never had she felt so utterly colorless and skinny and insignificant. Just where Lover's Lane debouched on the street, an old car was parked. Delancey knew that car well, by sound at least, and everybody in Deerwood knew it too. This was before the phrase Tin Lizzie had come into circulation in Deerwood at least. But if it had been known, this car was the tinniest of the Lizzie's, though it was not a Ford but an old gray Slauson. Nothing more battered and just dis dis disreputable could be imagined. It was Barney Snaith's car. What's with the names in the Snaith? Stickles and Snaith, anyway. It was Barney Snaith's car, and Barney himself was just scrambling up from under it, in overalls plastered with mud. Lancey gave him a swift, furtive look as she hurried by. This is only the second time she had ever seen the notorious Barney Snaith, so she had heard enough about him in the five years that he had been living up back in Muskoka. And um, for those of you who don't know what Muskoka is, Muskoka 
is they also call it cottage country. It's north of Toronto, and there's a lot of lakes there, a lot of cottages, and a lot of people go there for the summer. The first time he'd been, she'd seen was nearly a year ago on the Muskoka Road. He had been calling out from under his old car then, too, and he had given her a cheerful little grin as she went by, a little whimsical grin that gave him the look of an amused gnome. He didn't look bad, but she didn't believe he was bad, in spite of the wild yarns that were always being told of him. Of course, he went tearing through in that terrible old grey sloth and through Deerwood at all hours, when all decent people were in bed, often with old warring Abel, who made the night hideous with his howls, both of them dead drunk, my dear, and everyone knew he was an escaped convict and a defaulting bank clerk and a murderer in hiding and an infidel and an illegitimate son of old warring Abel Gray and the father warring Abel's illegitimate grandchild and a counterfeiter and a forger and a few other awful things. This, of course, that's what they all said. But still, the Lancy didn't believe he was bad. Nobody with a smile like that could be bad, no matter what he had done. It was that night the Prince of the Blue Castle changed from being of grim jaw and hair with a dash of premature gray to a rakish individual with overlong tawny hair, dashed with red, dark brown eyes, and ears that stuck out just enough to give him an alert look, but not enough to be called flying jibs. But he still retained something a little grim about the jaw. Barney Snaith looked even more disreputable than usual right now. It was very evident that he hadn't shaved for days, and his hands and arms, bare to the shoulders, were black with grease. But he was whistling gleefully to himself, and he seemed so happy that the Lancy envied him. She envied him his lightheartedness and his irresponsibility and his mysterious little cabin up on an island in Lake Mistavis. Even his rackety old Grace Slauson. Neither he nor his car had to be respectable and live up to traditions. He rattled past her a few minutes later, bareheaded, leaning back in his Lizzie at a rakish angle, his longish hair blowing in the wind, a venomous-looking old black pipe in his mouth. She envied him again. Men had the best of it, no doubt about that. This outlaw was happy, whatever he was or he wasn't. She, Valancey Sterling, respectable, well-behaved to the last degree, was terribly unhappy and had always been unhappy. So there you were. Valancey was just in time for supper. The sun had clouded over again, and a dismal, drizzling rain was falling again. Cousin Stickles, there's that name, had the neuralgia. The neuralgia. Valancey had to do the family darning, and there was no time for her book, Magic of Wings. Can't the darning wait till tomorrow, she pleaded. Tomorrow will bring its own duties, said Miss Frederick inexorably. Valancey darned all evening and listened to Frederick and Cousin Stickles talking the eternal niggling gossip of the clan, as they knitted dreadfully at Turnbull black stockings. They discussed second cousin Lillian's approaching wedding and all its bearings. On the whole, they approved. Second cousin Lillian was doing well for herself. Though she hasn't hurried, said Cousin Stickles, she must be twenty-five if she's a day. They have not, fortunately, been many old maids in our connection, said Miss Frederick bitterly. The Lancy flinched. She had run the darning needle into her finger. Third cousin Aaron Gray had been scratched by a cat and had blood poisoning in his finger. Cats are the most dangerous animals, Miss Frederick. I would never have a cat about the house. She glared significantly at the Lancy through her terrible glasses. Once, five years ago, the Lancy had asked if she might have a cat. She never referred to it since, but Miss Frederick still suspected her of harboring the unlawful desire in her heart of hearts. Once Valancey sneezed. Now, in the Sterling Code, it was very bad form to sneeze in public. She's in her own house. Why can't she sneeze? You can always repress a sneeze by pressing your finger on your upper lip, said Miss Frederick rebukingly. Half past nine o'clock, and so, as Miss Peppies would say, to bed. But first cousin Stickle's neurologic back must be rubbed with Redfern's liniment. That sounds like fun. Valancey did that. Valancey always hated to do it. She hated the smell of Redfern's liniment. She hated the smug, beaming, portly, bewhiskered, bespectacled picture of Dr. Redfern on the bottle. The figure smelled of the horrible stuff after she got into bed, in spite of all the scrubbing she gave him. Valancey's day of destiny had come and gone. She ended it as she had begun it, in tears.
So that's the reading for today. I'll try and do another one sooner than later. And so far, you can really see how difficult and sad this was for her. She's not had much life. She's been overburdened and over oppressed by her mother and her cousin Stickles and the rest of her family. She doesn't stand much of a chance. So we'll see in the next chapter what comes of this and what will come of her visit with Dr. Trent. Will she find out that she is sick or was it just a wasted visit? I've read the book, so I know the answer, but you will find out next chapter. So everybody, goodbye and have an awesomely great weekend. Bye.